believe everyone's starting to filter in here and we always typically give a minute or two for for stragglers to join but the, this this will be recorded so if you if you miss anything at the the start you can always tune in to the the youtube channel so thank you everyone for joining us for for another installment of our our webinar series and and what a timely topic indeed you know i'm i'm joined here today with with jack manley we're, we're going to be talking about the economy and and investing in an election year um i'll start by you know thanking our team and, and monica for for all the legwork and getting this set up and chris and Brittany at at jp morgan and and you know your support on that end so i i appreciate it thank you for bringing jack to us um just brief uh background jack's an executive director he's a global market strategist with jp morgan he is a frequent guest on bbn bloomberg CNBC, Fox Business, and he's oft, often quoted in the financial press. A graduate of University of Chicago with a background in history, he's a contributor to J.P. Morgan's long-term capital markets assumptions, and he's authored numerous papers on both global and domestic economies and capital markets. He's also responsible for delivering timely and market timely market and economic commentary to institutional retail clients across the United States and Canada. You know what what better time than than after yesterday's meeting which we'll certainly talk about but i'll i'll kick it over to you jack thank you all right well thanks very much jeff appreciate the introduction and thank you uh everybody for taking some time to dial in today uh clearly uh no shortage of stuff to talk about and and while you know my my mandate normally here at J.P. Morgan Asset Management is to be a global market strategist, so I spend a lot of time talking through economic data uh, and portfolio positioning across stocks, bonds, alternative assets. Uh, every time there is an election, so every four years, uh, I get a, a, a sort of new a, a new job added to my repertoire, which is to talk to uh, J.P. Morgan Asset Management's clients about how to invest in an election year. And uh, I will put my cards on the table right now and say that I hate talking about the election. I hate talking about politics. You never make everybody happy with this stuff. Uh, and in many ways, it's very easy to alienate your audience. So, you know, one of the struggles that we have here um, when it comes to communicating our views on investing is that you have to be able to talk about this stuff as dispassionately as possible, right? Remove all the emotion, try to remove all the opinions and focus in on those things that are actually tangible and might move the needle as it relates to our portfolios and long-term performance. That's kind of the spirit of this investing in an election year presentation. Uh, and that's how I keep myself sane when I give these kinds of talks, right? Moving the emotion and focusing in on those things that are actually going to move the needle from a portfolio construction perspective. So if we turn to the, the next page here, uh, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I would like to point out that somebody somewhere put together this very nice good looking graphic that kind of shows the 2024 election timeline. And here we are uh, over halfway through September, which means that we have rounded the corner on the bottom left side of the page and are very much in the home stretch. <clears throat> now, this is typically the period where you would be seeing presidential debates. Things are a little bit different this year as they've been in a lot of, of uh, as a lot of things have been different uh, this year. Right. We had a presidential debate over the summer, but at the time it was between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, the results of that presidential debate actually at least partially encouraged Joe Biden to drop out of the race. Uh, just about a week ago, we had a presidential debate between Joe Biden's replacement, Kamala Harris, and Donald Trump, uh, although it doesn't seem likely that another debate will be happening. At least that's uh, what the language is um, from, from, from the candidates here. So that might have been one and done in terms of our communication, um, seeing both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris up on stage together talking through uh, potential policy changes. If there is another debate, it'll happen in the next few weeks because in uh, a little under two months, it's election day, November 5th. This thing is sneaking up on us. Uh, I am shocked at how quickly it, it, it has arrived. And once election day comes and goes, uh, the Electoral College will officially cast its votes on the 17th of December and the new president will be sworn into office on the 20th of January in next year. 
Now, in that vein, right, if we turn to the next page here, most of the attention in this election cycle is being paid to the presidential election, right? That's what grabs all the headlines. Donald Trump versus Joe Biden, Donald Trump versus Kamala Harris. I have no insight whatsoever into who is going to win the presidential election. I can tell you that the betting odds are constantly in flux and will continue to be in flux all the way up to the morning of November 5th. A lot has happened over the last few months that have changed these voting odds, right? We saw, uh, for example, that debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden over the summer. President Biden uh, not performing as well as some people would have liked the odds of a Donald Trump victory creeping up higher. Not too long after that, there is an attempted assassination uh, of, of, uh, of, of Donald Trump. And that photo emerges, you know, defiant fist in the air, surrounded by Secret Service. And wow, the betting markets go crazy. Now everybody is convinced that Trump is going to be president. A couple of days later, Joe Biden is diagnosed with COVID. A couple of days after that, he drops out of the presidential race. Um, Kamala Harris is his presumed nominee. And as soon as we hear about that, well, all of a sudden, the betting odds change once again. The market thinks that Kamala Harris has a better chance of beating Donald Trump than Joe Biden does, right? And since then, we've had VP nominations. We have apparently another uh, attempted assassination on Donald Trump. We have, of course, uh, that, that more recent uh, presidential debate. All of this is to say once more, I am not Nate Silver. That is not the purpose of this talk is to tell you who's going to be president. But if you want to punish yourself and try to game out who's going to be president, what you have to acknowledge is that in reality, only a handful of states determine the presidency, right? Because uh, a president is not elected by popular vote. He, is, he or she is elected uh, through the Electoral College. Almost every state in the union, except for Maine and Nebraska, you can see here, uh, have a winner-take-all policy. And that means in states like California and New York, traditionally very blue, uh, or states like you know Texas or Florida, traditionally very red, you have a pretty good idea of where these different states are going to fall and where these electoral votes are therefore going to fall. There are seven battleground states in 2024's election, and we list them on the bottom right side of this page. Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Nevada, and Michigan. Now, five of these seven were key battleground states back in 2020. It's going to be the top five on this page. Nevada and Michigan end up looking a little bit tighter than we would have expected. They've been added to the list. But we also show on this page, right, the spread of victory, the margin of victory in these states that then resulted in the full quantity of electoral votes getting cast in the favor of one candidate or the other. And, and the, 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 the narrowness of these margins is shocking. I mean, 0.24% in Georgia, 12,000 votes, effectively the size of a small town, determining where all 16 electoral votes get cast. And this is, generally speaking, the narrative here in the tightest races. We are talking about under 100,000 people, generally speaking, in these different states, determining where all of these electoral votes end up going. Is it perfect? Maybe not. I am not here to debate the merits of the Electoral College. That is the way that this works, right? And so if you're trying to game out who's president, these are the races that you have to pay attention to. And all I can tell you is that they are likely going to be pretty tight. In other words... Still don't really know who's going to be president. But if we turn to the next page here, um, what we have to acknowledge, right, is that while we do spend a lot of time paying attention to the presidential election, it is certainly uh, the most exciting thing uh, in the election timeline. There are only a handful of policy areas where the president has real unilateral authority to do whatever he or she wants without some sort of assistance from Congress, from the legislative body through, you know, the enaction of, of new laws. And we have a bunch of different policy, uh, um, you know, sort of categories on this page. I've highlighted with gold stars the three where the president actually does have some sort of influence. They are trade, they are immigration, and they are energy. Those are the three where the president can really make a difference. So depending on who wins, this is where you may see um, some pretty uh, significant departures uh, in, in policy. 
you know, on trade. Um, it is it has been determined by an act of Congress many, many decades ago that trade is a matter of national security. And the president has the ability to set tariffs. Think about the trade war that was launched under Donald Trump. He was able to do that without congressional approval. Unilaterally through executive action, the president can levy tariffs on trading partners. Now, under a Harris administration, we would likely see a status quo tough on China continuing with some more targeted emphasis on certain goods that may be the product of, uh, of, of dumping, things like steel and aluminum. Meanwhile, under a potential Trump presidency, those tariffs on China would likely increase and a new universal baseline tariff could be implemented on most, if not all, of the U.S.'s trading partners. So in either case, we're being tough on China, but how tough we're being on China and how tough we're being on our other trading partners will be determined based off of who's in, who's in the White House. On immigration, uh, the president has no ability to set immigration law, right? It's a law, which means Congress has to do it, but they do have the ability to determine how strictly those laws are enforced. And we have very clearly seen uh, varying degrees of severity in the enforcement of immigration law over the last, um, let's call it, couple of administrations. Um, you know, Donald Trump, uh, um, you know, very strict with the border. Joe Biden, a little bit more lax with the border. Uh, if Kamala Harris were to get elected, she'd probably tighten things up a little bit, but keep them more or less in line with uh, what the Biden administration has been doing. If Donald Trump gets elected, well, uh, we're probably going to see um, a, a much stricter border policy, uh, which could include mass deportations. Um, that border policy might be stricter than it was even under his first administration. So again, another area where the president really matters from a policy perspective. And then on energy, I mean, I don't think you can, you can get a better example of what the president can do as it relates to energy policy than by thinking about the first 100 days of President Biden's term uh, and the series of executive actions that he issued that were quite hostile towards the fossil fuel industry, right? He uh, banned Keystone XL, that pipeline, he canceled uh, uh, or, or um, you know, put, a, put a moratorium on, uh, on new fracking on federal land. He put in place a, a mandate for the electrification of the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the the, the domestic vehicle fleet, right? These are the kinds of things that the, that the president can do. And, you know, if, if Kamala Harris gets elected, we probably continue to see um, those things, either they are maintained or they are intensified. Uh, if Donald Trump gets elected, well, you know, the, uh, the, the story changes a little bit, right? We probably see uh, more rhetoric about U.S. energy independence, more rhetoric about greater domestic production of oil and gas, some rolling back of environmental incentives, uh, rolling back of, of, of some of these, um, you know, clean energy, uh, green mandates that came out under, under the, the Biden administration. Again, the president has a lot of influence over, over this area. But basically, everything else on this page, taxes, defense, health care, regulation, monetary policy, these are things that require congressional uh, intervention, right? They require Congress to do something, to pass some sort of law for the needle to move in a, in a meaningful way. And so in that sense, if we look at the next page here, understanding the composition of Congress um, is important. And... When I think about what's going on, uh, if we look at the next page here, uh, if I think about what's going on in this country, um, you know, one of the things I, I can say very clearly uh, is that this is a divided country, right? Again, I don't know who's going to win, but but uh, uh, politics have become a lot more tribal over the last few years. We're moving further and further to either side of the aisle. And the way that this division is reflected in government is that whatever party is in control of whichever chamber of Congress, their margin of control is razor thin. Okay. So you look at the Senate, for example, here in the middle of the page, there are a hundred seats in the Senate. The Democrats control only 51 of them. Democrats control the Senate, but they only have 51 votes. That's about as narrow a margin as you can possibly get. You look at the House of Representatives, uh, 435 um, uh, 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 seats in, in there. Uh, the Democrats control 212 of them. So, again, just under 50 percent, which means the Republicans run the House. These are not massive majorities, which means these are not massive mandates. You know, you need 
60 votes in the Senate to beat a filibuster. You need two thirds of the vote in both the Senate and the House of Representatives to beat a presidential veto. You need a mandate to do anything with legislation unless you're trying to pass something kind of backdoor through budget reconciliation, which only happens about once a year. It's not a normal uh, legislative process. Now, again, looking forward, I don't know what's going to happen in November, but given how divided this economy, this country is, I have a hard time believing that either side of the aisle is going to achieve that supermajority. Either side of the aisle is going to achieve that mandate. And so from a legislative perspective, I would assume that it is more of the status quo gridlock in Washington. It doesn't matter if the Democrats control both chambers, one chamber, no chambers, Republicans, the same thing. If they can't get their supermajorities, they can't get their mandates. Most of the stuff that they are talking about is dead on arrival. And with that in mind, then, if we're trying to assess, if we're trying to game out what potential policy changes may happen, we have to understand the kinds of things that are going to happen either through bipartisan cooperation, where both sides of the aisle will agree to something, there will be no need for a veto or, or a, a filibuster, or things that are happening um, you know, basically through inertia, things that will happen uh, unless Congress does something to stop them. And that brings us now to uh, the, the next page um, in, this, in this talk. One of the things uh, that um, certainly will be uh, top of mind, right, is tax policy. And we have laid out here in, in, in detail uh, how Kamala Harris will likely approach tax policy, how Donald Trump will likely approach tax policy. Again, um, think of these as wish lists. They only get done with congressional um, approval. You need a captive Congress to be able to pass through most of this stuff. Uh, but this is more or less what the platform looks like from a tax perspective. The only thing you really need to know, though, is that at the end of next year, the end of 2025, a handful of key provisions from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the 2017 TCJA, the Trump era tax bill, are set to expire. Most of the corporate tax stuff has been enshrined into law permanently, which means it would require an act of Congress to adjust. But a lot of the household stuff will be going away. Right. The the reduction in the uh, federal income tax brackets across um, you know, uh, different income levels, the increased child tax credit, the increased uh, estate tax exemption, you know, the altered alternative minimum tax. All these things are on the chopping block at the end of, of next year. And unless there is, again, congressional intervention, these things are going away just because of inertia. Which means, assuming that uh, Congress is gridlocked like, like, like I project, um, you, know, you have to figure out where Democrats and Republicans can agree uh, on tax policy. You know, they probably can agree on um, you know, a lower federal income tax bracket for the lowest income earners in this country. OK, that might get extended. Uh, they probably can agree on uh, uh, you know, this higher, greater child tax credit. OK, that might get extended. Uh, but I very much doubt they agree on the uh, estate tax exemption. Right. I very much doubt they agree on, uh, on capital gains taxes. I very much doubt they agree on the uh, federal income tax rate for the highest earners in this country. And so, you know, kind of regardless of what happens in November, um, unless there is a wave that we are just not expecting, um, one of the things that you can take away from this election is that at some point within the next 14, 15 months, uh, some of your tax rates might be increasing and your tax burden as a result might be going up. Turning to the next page here, another thing that we see happening kind of regardless of the outcome uh, is that deficits are going to widen because it doesn't matter if you are a Republican or a Democrat, you like to spend money that you don't have. You know, we, we get to deficit spending in different ways. Republicans and Democrats think about it differently, but the end result is the same, which is deficit spending. It's borrowing, which in turn translates into debt loads. And you can see uh, per the Congressional Budget Office, uh, even if the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is not extended, we show this on the right hand side of this page, uh, federal net debt as a percentage of GDP is expected to hit almost 125 percent in the next decade. And all-time high uh, for this country. 
Now, a lot of people are looking for a magic number where all of a sudden all this stuff blows up, right? Is it a dollar figure? Is it a percentage? Is it a ratio? Well, that is not the way to think about this. The better way to approach it is to think about what it costs to service that debt. And if we look at the left-hand side of this page, we can see, looking at total government spending, that for every dollar Uncle Sam spends in 2024, 13 cents of it goes towards paying down our debt. And every time we issue debt, right, and the borrowing number increases and the debt load increases and we issue it at higher interest rates because even though the Fed is cutting rates, they're not going to be cutting down to zero anytime soon, that slice of the pie gets bigger and bigger all else help which means you're, you're kind of you know crowding out, I guess I would say, um, spending in these other categories. So where is the fat, right? What do you trim? Uh, well, you're not going to trim defense. It's bipartisan. Uh, you probably should trim entitlement benefits, things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They do not function the way that they were designed to, but no politician is running on that platform. And even if something were to happen, they're not going to happen very quickly. So really all you are left with on this page is that um, you know, purple bar over there, the non-defense discretionary spending uh, component, which is A, uh, not particularly large, uh, and B, uh, is the money that at least amongst other things is earmarked for uh, investment in bridges and roads and tunnels and hospitals and houses and schools and the stuff that makes us more productive. And we need investment in productivity today because the working age population growth is slipping, right? The, 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 the population is aging, the baby booms exiting the workforce, our birth rate continues to climb, we decline, we need more productivity. And if we can invest in productivity because we're spending all this money just paying down our debt, well, then we might be looking at steady state, lower economic growth, which could translate into steady state, lower revenue growth for corporate America, coupled with higher interest rates because our creditors demand more from us for spending so recklessly, or higher taxes, again, bringing that conversation down the line. This is not a pleasant reality, but it is reality, and it seems to be something that will happen uh, uh, inevitably, right? Again, a lot of inertia here, um, both sides of the aisle keen on continuing this kind of bread and circuses mentality uh, that has become so popular with populism uh, over the last uh, five to ten years. And now on the next page here, the last kind of um, policy thing that I will I will bring up at least uh, is that regardless of who wins, as I, I alluded to earlier, uh, we are going to stay tough on China. And the way that staying tough on China is reflected in the economy is through supply chain reorganization. Do you look at U.S. goods imports on the left-hand side of this page? And you can see, looking at the red line, that our imports from China have fallen precipitously. They're about at a 20-year low uh, following the, uh, uh, the the start of that trade war under um, under the, the Trump administration. Now, a lot of people think that as we move away from China and the West moves away from China, we are de-globalizing. But that is not what is happening. I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that we are importing more from Mexico than we are from China, more from Europe than from China, more from uh, Canada than from China. We are about to import more from Vietnam, Korea, and Taiwan than from China. And that line uh, looking at Indian imports continues to slowly but surely tick up higher. In other words, we are not deglobalizing here. We are simply re-globalizing. And there are a whole list of countries lining up to pick up that mantle of responsibility uh, that China is shrugging off for one reason or another. Again, another kind of inevitability in the aftermath of, uh, of, of November 5th's election. Which brings us now to uh, sort of the last portion of this talk. Um, if we turn to the next page here, uh, what does all this mean from a markets perspective? Well, I, I kind of led off by saying, right, that while we spend a lot of time paying attention to who's going to be president, there are only a few areas where the president actually matters. Uh, Congress matters a whole lot more for most of the policy that will impact your portfolios. And right now, um, you know, gridlock seems likely because uh, no mandate is likely to emerge. But at a very high level, right, we have to acknowledge uh, that elections are sources of volatility because they are sources of uncertainty, right? Like 
we don't know who's going to be president. We don't know what the composition of Congress looks like. Maybe there is a wave that nobody is expecting. It happened back in 2020 um, when the Democrats unexpectedly took uh, uh, took Georgia um, you know, for, for the Senate um, and, and changed the balance of power. Anything can happen. We don't know. The good news, though, is that once Election Day hits, a lot of that uncertainty vanishes because we know what the composition of government will look like. And I can tell you firsthand, markets don't care who's president. Just want to know so they can plan for or around any potential policy changes coming down the line. So one thing to remember here in general uh, is that, you know, you got to keep your nose to the grindstone. you got to acknowledge that Congress matters, that, um, uh, uh, that gridlock is likely, and that the volatility we've been experiencing, at least the volatility to the election, will die by the end of this year. But if we turn, at the, turn to the next page here, we also have to acknowledge, right, that while this industry does everything in its power to tell you uh, to not worry about politics, to not worry about the elections, not worry about policy, and that the stock market will go up and the economy will go up no matter what. It is sort of a um, dissatisfying, uh, uh, you know, way to close, right? It, it's it, it feels almost dishonest. Like, how can you tell me? Uh, that tax policy doesn't make a difference or that immigration policy doesn't make a difference or trade policy doesn't make a difference. And the reality is that uh, a policy does matter. It matters a lot, but it doesn't operate in a vacuum. And I don't think there's a better way to illustrate this point uh, than this page that we have up in front of you right now. And you know, it looks at the performance in gray of the S&P 500 energy index. So think good old fashioned traditional fossil fuels, oil and gas. And in green, the S&P global clean energy index. In other words, uh, money that is going into renewable resources. So, you know, that could be carbon capture tech, but it could also be solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, um, you know, hydrogen, whatever it, it happens to be. And if you were to, you know, close your eyes for a moment and forget that you saw this page and I asked you, polled the audience, what do you think would have done better under a Trump administration, fossil fuels or clean energy? You'd probably say fossil fuels. And if I asked you what you think would have done better under a Biden administration, fossil fuels or clean energy, you'd probably say clean energy. Because unless you're living under a rock, you know exactly how these two candidates or, or individuals feel about this stuff, right? They could not be more clear about how they think about energy policy. And yet you're completely wrong assuming that you guess the way that I think you're going to guess, right? Because under a Trump administration, fossil fuels got beat up and clean energy you tripled your money. And under a Biden administration, fossil fuel, or clean energy collapses and under uh, and, and fossil fuels, you double your money, right? And it's not because um, uh, policy doesn't matter, but again, it's because it doesn't operate in a vacuum. There are a lot of other things going on around the world, like, hey, a pandemic and a change in rate environments and Wars in Eastern Europe and wars in the Middle East that evidently have had more of an impact on the relative performance of clean versus traditional uh, energy products than the policies uh, coming out of either one of these administrations. So, you know, I think this is a very helpful and powerful way to land right after all this talk about what's going on with the election and how to think about it. It's all important without a doubt. But do not let any of this stuff steer how you think about portfolio construction. So with that, Jeff, I, uh, I will pass things back over to you. Again, I'd like to thank you all very much for the time. Very nice to be here. Hope this was helpful. Uh, but Jeff, again, back to you. Jack, thank you so much. That was that was a lot to take in, um, you know, and, and great job relating it back to <clears throat> asset allocation and, and, you know, predictability of, of, of what you think might happen based on the current, you know, administration. I mean, for, for that matter, you know, we, we get to the, the start of the year, phenomenal year with, with stocks and bond, you know, maybe not so much bonds last year. Uh, people thought the market was expensive when we, we kicked off this year, you know, we'll look where yep. we are today. Things continue yep. to go up. We go through a summer pre pre-election year, I think overall, from a volatility standpoint, it was it was a lot less than what people may have thought or expected. We, we've seen it as of late, but you know, diversification is is always important. Um, you know, as it relates to the the construct of the the House, the Senate, you know, I, I, I know you referenced supermajority. Is there a makeup that tends to um, bode well for for getting policy 
in place or, or, or um, approved or a situation? I, my, my question is more related to when you get, you've seen Congress as of late become very, um, you know, they're 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 not willing to, to budge. And so when you have a certain situation in place, not a supermajority, you know, it might be hard and, and you worry about, you know, government shutdowns and things of the sort. Right. Um, I would say, I mean, if you're looking, if you're trying to figure out what part of Congress probably matters more for policy, I would say it's going to be the Senate rather than the House, uh, because the Senate is where the filibuster happens. And um, you, know, you can pass things by a fairly simple majority in the House of Representatives that then gets stonewalled in the Senate by by filibuster. Um, and that is uh, not something that would happen if you have that that 60 votes. So, again, if you're trying to, like, game theory all this about um, the composition of the Senate is going to matter more than the composition of the House when it comes to potentially enacting policy moving forward. But, you know, a lot of the things that you described here, Jeff, like there there needs to be bipartisan cooperation. There needs to be, you know, the, the willingness to reach across the aisle and shake hands with somebody that might be ideologically opposite you. Um, and that is harder to come by, which is why we have these crazy debt ceiling standoffs. That was a great example, right? Like nobody in their right mind wants the United States to default on, on their debt. Um, it would be it would be suicide. It would be extraordinarily stupid uh, to let the United States default on, on its debt. And I don't think anybody in Washington actually wants that to happen. Um, but, you know, egos get in the way and, and, and you know, a lot of this is very short term and, and election cycle focused. And uh, you, you hope that the, you, know, you hope that the, the, the big boys and big girls get together and, and, and think about this stuff realistically. But yeah. Um, yeah. bipartisan cooperation is the name of the game. And unfortunately, it's getting rarer and rarer. So so just yesterday, I, I referenced it at the start of the conversation, but but we had a, a you know, right movement. We had a Fed meeting. Uh, a lot of information came out. You know, I I heard on the Trump side, he, he felt as if um, you know, so close to an election, kind of gaming the system. But w- what were your thoughts? What were your takeaways from the Fed meeting? Uh, we we see a, a you know, just just after they announced the rate cut, market popped. It ended. S and P ended the day down. Today we have a, a significant positive market. But I mean, what what are some of your more longer term takeaways from from the um, uh, 50 point. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let, let's let's approach this two ways, Jeff, if that's OK. I think the first one would be to talk about it in the context of the election. And then second, to talk about some of the, the, the kind of longer term, um, the, the longer term phenomena here. Yeah, um, I I don't think the Fed made the right call yesterday. We can get into that in a moment. But I don't think that that has anything to do with politics. And, and I have two reasons to say that. Uh, the first one is that if you look at every uh, presidential election going back to 1980, um, so that's 11 presidential elections before this one, in 10 of those 11 cycles, the Federal Reserve did something with interest rates. So the, if the Fed were to sit out during an election year, that would be the anomaly. That would be unusual. The Fed, more often than not, by, by a very wide margin, does manipulate monetary policy during election years if it feels like it has to, and it feels like it has to because of changing economic conditions, right? And I would say um, that uh, given what's going on with the labor market, given what's going on with inflation and how that's cooling, the Fed should absolutely be cutting rates uh, 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 this year, right? So that's one thing I'd say as it relates to the election. I, I don't think this, this decision was politically motivated because there's a lot of historical precedent. I also don't think this decision is politically motivated because while Donald Trump and Jay Powell may not get along very well, uh, there is not a whole lot that Donald Trump can do about Jay Powell, right? Like, the, the, it, it, to, to be on the Federal Reserve, to sit on the board of the Federal Reserve, uh, you have not a lifetime appointment, but I believe it's a 14-year-long appointment. Uh, the president does not uh, have the authority to remove people from the Federal Reserve. You just can't do it. What he can do is, is make sure that Jay Powell is no longer the chair of the Federal Reserve, um, but uh, he can't get Jay Powell off of the voting committee. And the fact that this is a democracy, that the monetary policy is done by votes, not done by decree, right? It's not just Jay Powell making a decision, even if 
you know, in this hypothetical world, Donald Trump removes Jay Powell and installs in his place someone that is a lot more, um, you know, amenable to the way that Donald Trump thinks about monetary policy, this person would still have to convince every other voting member of the FOMC to go in that direction. If the only way that that gets changed is through an act of Congress, because the Federal Reserve is set up through an act of Congress. So, you know, if you want to give the chair unilateral authority or you want to dissolve the Fed in general, you cannot do that as the president. You need Congress to step in. And again, this comes back to our story about Greylock. So it's not like, you know, Jay Powell may like his job as the chair of the FOMC, but it's not like he's worried about the future of monetary policy and he's desperate to keep Trump out of the White House. Like, I don't think that's the way to think to think about this either. So, again, in both senses, I don't I don't think that this decision yesterday was politically motivated. That said, like I mentioned earlier, I don't think it was a good decision. Um, I don't think that the I think while the economy needs lower interest rates, it doesn't need very like, significantly lower interest rates. And I feel like the messages sent between the employment report and the, jo- uh, uh, the inflation report over the last few weeks are kind of mixed. They aren't both in the same camp that would justify a 50 basis point cut. I think you could have flipped the coin here and said 25 or 50. But what I'm more concerned about and more confused about, frankly, Jeff, is not the 50 basis point cut in September, but the fact that the Fed has now told us to expect another 50 basis point cuts uh, of cuts before the year is up. That is very, very different from what they were telling us back in, in June, certainly what they were telling us back in March. And that, to me, says that the Fed is worried about the economy. And if the Fed is worried about the economy and it's going to cut rates by 100 basis points or more, the equity market should not be cheering this on because if the economy is not doing well, the stock market doesn't do well either. So I think there is like a, an intellectual disconnect here between what the Fed did yesterday and what they telegraphed looking forward and how the market has responded. Uh, and I don't think it makes any sense that the S&P is up almost 2% right now as we speak and we've broken through to all-time highs. That is uh, uh, I, I, not the way to play this, I, I would argue. So um, a couple different ways to approach that that conversation, but certainly topical and will stay topical all the way through uh, the end of 2026, I would imagine, um, monetary policy and interest rates. Would, would you sit on the side that, that- – Maybe they should have cut 25 basis points back in June or March, and and this decision was, you know, kind of making up for lost ground. Or, yeah, I, I think that's that's probably a good way to interpret it. I think they should have cut a year ago, Jeff. I mean, like you know, a year ago we had an unemployment rate of three and a half percent and inflation at three percent, and that's the soft landing that everybody's been talking about. We were there a year ago. Why not start cutting gradually back then? I think there's a very clear argument that the Fed is behind. Um, you know, behind the curve on this one, that they may need to play a little bit of catch up. But if you you, you can't do this too aggressively, you start sending the wrong signals to markets that everybody needs to be freaking out. So, you know, this they made their bed, they got to sleep in it now. Um, I think they've mismanaged policy more or less the whole way through. Uh, but you know, 100 basis points of cuts this year is not the positive sign that the market seems to be thinking it is. Yeah, yeah, and and I don't pretend to be an expert in the area, but but uh, I've heard of a lot of people who I, I respect their opinion and, and have a lot of um, ability to, to track data, but the their view is that the um, Federal Reserve's method in calculating inflation is just broken, and it's a little bit incorrect. So inflation was actually much more under control than they thought, um, but, uh, you know, we can we can probably pontificate on this and, and chat back and forth for for sure. an hour or two. But I I want to thank you for for your time. I appreciate it. Um, you know your your support, your firm support has been um, uh, massive. Thank you for everyone that joined. Um, we're, we'll have the the material, the the slides that we can send out, and we'll post the video online if if you join late. But as always, keep keep tuning in. Keep an eye on our monthly newsletter and, and we'll we'll be back to you soon. All right. Thanks, Jack. Thanks everybody. Take care, Jeff. Yep. You as well.